God's word for today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not extinguish the Spirit, but treat, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test everything, hold on to the good, keep away from every kind of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. This is God's word. I invite you to pray with me. Direct us now, O gracious Lord, to hear aright your holy word. Assist your minister to preach and let the Holy Spirit teach. And let eternal life be found by all who hear the gospel sound. Amen. Show of hands, how many of you woke up this morning thinking of December 7th, 1941? Always remember, never forget. Show of hands, how many of you woke up this morning remembering the Alamo? Always remember, never forget. Always means always. When we tell our kids, always look both ways before crossing the street, we're saying, don't just look, don't just do it the day that I tell you to look both ways. Do it all the time. Always look both ways. Always place, say please and thank you. We throw those terms around all the time, don't we? Always. Always remember. Never forget. But we don't always remember. And we sometimes forget. We treat that phrase, always remember, never forget, almost like a Charlie Brown trombone parent. Wah, 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 wah. Sure, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll remember. Yep, 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 I got it. But we don't always remember. There's a phrase, always and never are two words you should never say ever. You should, there are two words you should always remember never to say. Always, never. It grinds my gears when I hear a pastor say it from a pulpit. Always remember. Like, I just know, I've just known you for 15 minutes, and now you're, you're, you're going to put something on my perpetual to-do list for the rest of my life. Now you're going to guilt me for the rest of my life that if I don't do whatever it is you're going to talk about, then somehow I'm, I'm less of a Christian. But pastor, I see your sermon theme you must always remember. Yeah. That's because that's what Paul says, and I'm going to explain what is meant by you must always remember. The Apostle Paul, when he is writing to the Thessalonians, Christians who had been dealing with a lot, a lot of struggles and, and persecutions, and he is writing this letter encouraging them. It's one of the first letters uh, that we have of the epistles, the first of the epistle letters that we have. And he gets to this chapter, and he's giving them some encouragement about how to live as a Christian, and he says, rejoice always. Now, he even puts the always word in a place of emphasis. So it's like always, always, not just on December 7th, not just every once in a while, but always, always rejoice. And this joy isn't just um, happiness, like you you got a smile on your face all the time. This joy is this uh, idea of your relationship with God what Isaiah was talking about in our first lesson for today. How we we consider what God has done for us, and this fills us with something, with a joy. Uh, 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 um, C.S. Lewis said it is a unsatisfied desire, which is itself more desirable than any other satisfaction. An unsatisfied desire, which is itself more desirable than any other satisfaction. This idea of satisfaction that's not finished idea of, I keep using the word, I always tell my kids, don't use the word and when you're defining the word. You're filled with uh, joy. This is a, an, an exuberance, a satisfaction, a, a, a positive emotion because of our relationship with God, because of what God has done for us. Rejoice always, Paul says. Then he says, pray without ceasing. And again, He's saying always, 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 always pray without ceasing. What does that mean to pray without stopping? Does that mean we need to be walking around folding our hands all the time or having our hands open like this? This is that state of always perpetual being, perpetually being ready to have a conversation with God or in a conversation with God. 
Pray without ceasing, he says. Always be ready to pray. Always have that conversation going with your God. In everything, give thanks. Not just when the harvest comes in, but when the harvester isn't working. Give thanks. In all circumstances, Paul says, give thanks. Always, always. Have I put the burden on your shoulders enough yet? Are you feeling like you are less of a Christian? Well, why should we do this all the time? Maybe somebody would react and say, Pastor, this is unreasonable demands of God to tell us that we should always be filled with a joy in our relationship with God and what he had done for us, this unsatiable desire of all of the, the, this positive emotion that we have because of what God has done for us. We're always supposed to have this. We're always supposed to be praying, always supposed to be ready to, to be talking to God. We're always supposed to be giving thanks. That's kind of a tall order for God to tell us to do that all the time. Maybe we can do it once a week or once in a while, but why all the time? Well, does God interact in our life every once in a while? Did the sun, does the sun only come up four out of the seven days of the week? Does God provide for your family? Does God provide healing and relief only on certain months? He's an always, always kind of God, isn't he? He is always providing for us. He is always loving us. He is always forgiving us of our sins through Jesus Christ. He's always ready to forgive. He's an always, always kind of guy. So should we not respond and always be joyful? Praying without ceasing and everything give thanks. You must always remember. Boy, what a burden. And we forget We don't deserve to have a God who is always, always. We don't deserve to have a God who is always there for us, who is always ready to listen, who is always ready to forgive, who is always ready to provide, who is always ready to act. We don't deserve that kind of God, do we? Nobody does. But that is the God that we have. You should always remember, that's what Paul is saying in this whole section. You must always remember. But that's not all that Paul says. In fact, in that sermon theme, when I said you must always remember, the you wasn't you. The you is God. That's our prayer to God. God, you must always remember. What should he always remember? What Paul says in verses 23 and 24. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Here Paul breaks into prayer. May the God of peace. Why is God the God of peace for you and for me? Because he is the one who sent his son Jesus to die for you. He is the one who sanctifies you. And confirmation kids know what the word sanctify means, but if, if, if it's been a while, sanctify means to set you apart from this unbelieving world, to make you different from everybody else, different in the fact that you're going to be a little, you are going to be a little bit more joyful and praying more and thankful than your unbelieving neighbor and friend. Because this is an activity of God in your heart through his word. A God who is always, always working in your heart to be different than you once were. That that continual process of setting you apart, of first of all, forgiving you of your sins because Jesus, because Jesus was always, always, always joyful, always praying to his heavenly Father, always thankful, always holding on to God's word. Jesus was always, always in your place and mine. And because of him, God also works in your heart life and and mine. God the Holy Spirit does some amazing things, keeping us blameless. Blameless not because of anything we've done, but because of Jesus. And here he has that interesting uh, division, soul, spirit, and body. Those two immaterial things, your soul and your spirit, those are two things you really can't divide. Your I mean, who you are is your soul, your personality, everything about you. You are more than the sum of your parts. You are a spiritual being in a physical body. 
your, that's your soul. But that soul is being acted on by the Holy Spirit, as he talked about earlier in this text. Don't quench out the Holy Spirit's fire, he says. Remember how Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, when he says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. So this whole idea of this, this, this person, this who you are, this spiritual being inside of you is being worked on by another force. And if you could somehow divide it, you've got a spirit and a soul, but it, it really, they're, they're both the same. Our soul of who we are is a combination of this new person caused by the Holy Spirit and that old sinful self that we had before. So it, our, who we are is really qu- quite complex. But Paul is saying our whole body, everything about us, body, soul, spirit, let that be worked on by the Holy Spirit that sets us apart from this unbelieving world so that we're different than we were than the person that we were yesterday. That we are blameless because of Jesus, not because we're perfect or holy, but we're blameless. We have his righteousness, not our righteousness. Lord, you always remember to be the faithful God that you are. God is faithful, Paul says, and he will do it. So when you hear this section about (laughs) always rejoicing and praying without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Don't uh, hold the prophecies of God. Hold on to God's word. Don't hold the prophecies of God in in contempt. And you you hear those words and and you're burdened by them because you're not always, always. Keep reading. Verses 23 to 24. To the God who is always, always. To God the Holy Spirit who is always there working in your heart and in mine through the word and through the Lord's Supper, through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, together with the bread and wine, that we would be the people that God has called us to be. And when God looks at you and me, he, he sees people who are blameless because he sees the righteousness of Jesus. He doesn't see our righteousness. Our righteousness is still work in progress. Our, work, our life of sanctification is still a work in progress. We're still being worked on by this Holy Spirit who is always, always ready to work on you and work on me. So, you must always remember, not you, God. God, you must always remember. You must always remember to be who you said you are. Amen.